Good evening, everyone. So I'm Bill Doley, President and CEO of Archaeology Southwest. We're a Tucson-based nonprofit and uh, happy to have this opportunity to have an element of our preservation archaeology uh, mission shared really across the nation. So I also want to start by acknowledging that Tucson is the homeland of the Aata. And please, wherever you are tonight, take a moment and reflect on what uh, part of the uh, native homeland you are um, a guest on tonight. And one other set of thanks go out to our pr uh, program sponsors, the Smith family. Um, they've been uh, great sponsors of this entire avian archeology span series. And uh, this is number eight, the final one of the avian archeology span um, presentations. So, um, I just want to make sure I get a short little announcement out about the upcoming magazine. I'm sure that we'll mention it in, in the um, talk tonight, but um, the uh, we are in the very, very final home stretch element of, of getting this magazine um, off to press and um, our content editor, um, Kate Sarthur wanted all of the authors who might be watching tonight know that check your inboxes tomorrow because you will see your uh, proofs uh, arriving and it's it's magnificent. Um, so anyway, uh, so and the magazine uh, probably about a month from now, uh, end of the month. Um, so it, there's there's a lot more coming. Uh, special. Thanks to, to Chris Schwartz and, and, and Kate Bishop, who, who put this incredible avian archaeology series that we've been presenting this, this year, this season together and assembled a, an incredible team of, of um, authors and, and writers. And it, so anyway, it's, this has been a really enjoyable experience to deal with folks here on screen and uh, the written version and uh, the one that you can hold in your hand is also going to be magnificent. So um, tonight we have actually three potential speakers, but I, I want to call them three authors and one um, primary speaker. So Chris Chris Swartz, who's a uh, uh, recent uh, PhD from Arizona State University, is up at uh, uh, Northern Arizona U University. Um, Pat Gilman and I go back to 1973. <laughs> so, um, when we were both uh, grad students here at the University of Arizona, Pat um, retired from University of Oklahoma. Um, so one of our three authors tonight and then Steve Plogg retired from um, University of Virginia. And so it's really an honor to have these three, um, you know, folks who have come together to for this presentation tonight. And Chris, um, I'll let you take the show over here um, and we'll talk about birds of the sun, macaws, parents, parrots, and people. So I'll, we'll be back a, a little later with opportunities for questions as well. Absolutely, thank you so much, Bill. All right, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Um, someone can hop on and let me know if, if you can't see or hear anything, but uh, everything looks good on my end. Um, again, thank you so much, Bill. Thank you, Linda. And thanks to the entire team at Archaeology Southwest uh, for this incredible avian archaeology series. It's been really, really fun to watch some of the, uh, the great presenters we've had so far. Um, I wa also want to say that this, this whole series might not have been possible without the opportunity that Kate Sarther um, and her team gave to me and, and Dr. Caitlin Bishop to arrange over visiting birds in the Southwest issue. Um, which you'll get a preview of toward the end of the end of the presentation. Um, and again, many of these speakers came from this magazine issue, and there are so many wonderful um, articles in the issue that that we didn't get to hear to, uh, in the speaking series. So I'm looking forward to everyone seeing that in about a month. Uh, in terms of this project specifically, uh, this is a really a massively collective effort. Um, and although this presentation has my name um, and Dr. Patricia Gilman and Dr. Stephen Plog's names on it. It's really going to draw on the work uh, of a series of authors that were involved in a, in a much larger book project. Uh, and, and it was the result of an, of an Ameren seminar at the Ameren Foundation in 2019. <clears throat> and 
I also want to say that this, this presentation is going to take us all over the United States Southwest and Mexican Northwest, uh, which I'm going to abbreviate for, uh, for brevity as the Southwest Northwest from now on. And I also want to echo Bill's sentiments and acknowledge and thank the past and present indigenous communities throughout the Southwest Northwest for their con continued stewardship of the lands that we'll be discussing tonight. Uh, I have the really incredible fortune to present from Flagstaff, which sits at the base of the San Francisco Peaks, which we know is a sacred place for many Pueblos and tribal nations throughout the region. Um, and this rich surrounding cultural landscape is, is really never lost on me. So, um, so as my first, our first slide today, I want to uh, um, start on a somewhat somber note, um, but recognize the, the very recent passing of Charmaine McCusick. And, uh, and Charm's work was really foundational for many of the presenters. I only had the opportunity to, to, to talk to her just a handful of times, but I know that her work was foundational for many of the presenters in the Avian Archaeology series, many of the contributors to the Archaeology Southwest um, Revisiting Birds issue. Um, and she's really going to be greatly missed by, by many folks, both in Southwest Northwest Archaeology, as well as in, in larger ornithological communities. So, okay. So with that, let's get into um, talking about Birds of the Sun. We have four types of parrots that are native to Mesoamerica and have been found in the Southwest Northwest. And we've listed them all here for you, right? The red, brilliant scarlet macaws that will be the major focus of our, our discussion tonight. Uh, we also have the predominantly green but multicolored military macaws, as well as thick-billed parrots and white-fronted parrots that are all, all found in the Southwest Northwest. Now, three of these birds, the military macaw, the white-fronted parrot, and the thick-billed parrot, are native to the area around um, just south of, of what we'd call the Southwest um, in Sonoran Chihuahua, following the Sierra Madre Occidental Mountains, all the way down the west coast of Mexico, right? So uh, even though they would have been closer to folks living in the Southwest Northwest area, <clears throat> of these four, scarlet macaws are by far the most common that we see at archeological sites, right? And we've recorded um, over 700 instances uh, of scarlet, or I should say over, over 500 instances of scarlet macaws, over 700 total instances of macaws in, uh, in this wide region. And we know uh, that these, these birds, we have the, the live birds, but we also want to state that their feathers uh, would have been incredibly important to people. You can see the multicolors, not just in the, in the scarlet macaws, but also in the military macaws um, that would have been really important to people, would have, would have um, made people want to go over long distances to get them. And I'm going to talk a little bit to start about the cultural significance of scarlet macaws. Um, as we know, colors were and continue to be important in pre-Hispanic religion and ritual in this region. Um, they're oftentimes associated with different directions. Um, and red, yellow, and blue, green, uh, which we see on scarlet macaws, are among the most significant uh, of the colors uh, with, with associated directions and, and, and other objects and, and materials. Uh, and macaws specifically would have been important. I, I love to say this, that they're animate beings. They're capable of mimicking human speech, which is something that um, today I think is so, so incredible. Uh, but I also wanna recognize that given the, the larger indigenous taxonomy of the Southwest Northwest, the lines between people and animals were often blurred in ways that perhaps in Western traditions, we don't um, so much recognize uh, and understand, right? So this idea of, of macaws mimicking human speech, uh, although you know, incredibly to, to, from a Western perspective, maybe something that, that might be more commonplace um, in, in indigenous perspectives, especially in this region. Um, along with ravens and crows, parrots have really advanced cognitive abilities, um, and this might account for their significance in origin stories that we see. And I was just telling um, my, my collaborators that I was watching, a, I was on a Reddit forum the other day where they were talking about how ravens were bringing, uh, were bringing back shiny trinkets and things like that in, in exchange for food. Um, so something really, really interesting. Parrots similarly have, um, have really advanced cognitive abilities, can, can fly certain places when they're directed to, can do things when they're directed to or asked to. Uh, and then finally, macaw feathers are used in multiple aspects of ritual. This ranges from ceremonial attire, uh, prayer sticks into ritual bundles and things like that. And we have an example here on the right side of the screen of a macaw feather bundle uh, from Allen Canyon in southeastern Utah. And you can see the multicolored feathers and the, and the different uh, taxa, different birds that might have been represented as well here. So moving into contemporary understandings of macaws uh, in, the, in the Pueblos today, uh, we're going to draw here on the work of Octavia Seotua, who is an uh, indigenous archaeologist and traditional knowledge keeper uh, at Zuni, um, and talk about, he gives us a really incredible overview of Zuni uses of macaws, uh, and he specifically talks about how macaw eggs and raven eggs are part of a larger Zuni origin story, whereby some early um, Zuni clans were moving 
over the landscape and came to a point where they, they were given the choice to select between an, uh, a relatively basic standard looking white macaw egg and a uh, turquoise blue colored raven egg. And people chose, um, some people chose the macaw egg uh, that hatched and brought people to the south. And some people chose the land of the everlasting sunshine. And some people chose the raven egg and brought them into the land of winter. Um, and I don't wanna, I don't wanna tell too much more about that story now, but he also tells us that the, the largest Zuni clan is the macaw clan. Um, and that macaws and their feathers are really important in curing rituals and specific dances. Um, and I'll transition into a chapter by Peter Whiteley, who also talks about uh, macaws and parrots and their pivotal role uh, and pervasive role in Pueblo myth, uh, ritual, and social structure. <clears throat> he also talks about this the same story, the same Zuni origin story about the macaw and raven eggs, and this being associated with the origins of social structure um, for, for Zuni people. Uh, he notes that macaws uh, and their feathers are aligned with the sun, the direction south, squash flowers, spondylus shells, coral, as well as the color red, of course. Um, and their significance cross cuts Pueblo language groups today, despite the sustained colonial repression of indigenous ritual, right? So in some ways, a form of resistance that, that's continued today. And I think this is something that's not incredibly surprising, right, to folks who are very familiar with um, Pueblo ethnogenesis and how how um, when we're getting away from kind of the standard and really static notions of the Pueblos today that, that, that are oftentimes, you know, propagated and that we oftentimes hear about and really understanding this long-term tradition of, of movement and people moving across the landscape and, and uh, meeting and interacting with people in different places and different times and perhaps bringing things like macaws and macaw feathers along in those, um, in those journeys. And he also states that Hopi Macaw Parrot Clan is the only clan named after a non-native plant or animal, right? Another point of, of great significance. So to take a, take a step back for a second, um, we also want to take a look at the antiquity of macaws, right? How far back in the past do macaws go? And this story really starts in Mesoamerica. Um, and this uh, contribution to the, to the book project is, is research done by Ben Nelson and, and Jose Luis Punzo that, that brought me along for the ride. Um, and they, they really just, uh, we really showed in this chapter that macaws were an important element of Mesoamerican cosmology. And we can see ethno histories and codices this depictions like you're seeing here in the Codex Borgia on the left. Uh, and you see macaws in the 13th position up at the very top right here um, in associations with the sun um, in mythic associations with the sun and fire, uh, as well as materially in the use of feathers as symbols of status. <clears throat> and uh, as well, figuring really importantly into tributes um, and the codices that, that, de that depict the tributes, right? The Aztec tributes specifically in feather bundles um, that were transported over long distances. We also see macaws depicted in clay, in stone, in ceramic iconography, and in various different painted images um, over time and space, although not quite to the extent that we see in the Southwest Northwest, as we'll talk about a little bit later in the talk. Now, you would think, based on all of this evidence, that macaws must have been really important to people living in Mesoamerica, right? If they're depicted in all these different kinds of ways, they, they're, uh, they, you, they show up over time and space, they're in this area, right? They're native to this area in the Gulf Coast of Mexico and Southern Mexico um, and, and to the South. But the actual evidence of it is that macaw uh, remains are actually quite rare in archeological contexts in Mesoamerica. And this is just a, a really brief table looking at some of the instances that we have, right? Tracing back into the BCE times, right? The formative period um, where military macaws seem to be important in some of those really early contexts. <clears throat> and into the classic period in the late post clock in the 1200s, 1300s, 1400s and on, um, we see almost entirely uh, or primarily military macaws. We see some indeterminate instances. We see two instances of confirmed scarlet macaws in all of Mesoamerica over thousands of years. Um, and I wanna highlight, we see them also in, in dedicatory offerings and offering caches. That seems really common in refuse occasionally, but I wanna highlight also that they seem to appear um, not in areas where we think people would have gotten macaws, where people from the Southwest Northwest could have gotten those macaws. And I highlight specifically the Huasteca region of the Eastern Gulf Coast of Mexico and then the West Coast of Mexico. And there is one or two instances of macaws from a site called Vista Hermosa uh, in the Huasteca region in the Northern part of Tamaulipas uh, where we see scarlet macaws, right? And so this idea that people in the Southwest were probably procuring large amounts of macaws from either the, uh, the Eastern Gulf Coast along the Rio Grande and, and coming up that route or along the West Coast of Mexico, um, although plausible and possible, um, does not seem to be played out in, in archeological evidence, right? And it could be that the proximity that people have in Mesoamerica to the birds um, maybe negated that, right? Maybe um, birds appeared in different ways for that reason. So, so with that in mind, 
let's talk about some of the key research questions that we have um, in looking at scarlet macaws in the Southwest Northwest. Um, and these were where and when were macaws present in the Southwest Northwest, right? We know um, based on some preliminary studies that they're not present in every time and place. Um, and we also wanted to take a, a look at radiocarbon dating to understand what are the time periods that we see them represented in? Uh, what factors might explain this episodic distribution in time and space as well, where kinds of things are going on that, that would mandate um, the procurement of macaws at different times? Uh, moving on, what do archeological contexts and skeletal completeness, whether the birds are whole, partial, or maybe just a few bones, suggest about the roles of macaws, right? Why they might be important to people. Is this, are these patterns similar everywhere? Do we have different placement in different archeological sites or regions? Um, and do we see final depositions that have different associations with people? Are macaws associated with people? Or are they buried with people? That didn't really seem to be a pattern in Mesoamerica, but perhaps in the Southwest Northwest, it, it will be. Um, and we're also interested in, in some more modern techniques looking at what do isotopic analyses suggest about the diet of macaws and the locations where they would have been raised? And then what does DNA sequencing suggest about where macaws were acquired and whether there were breeding centers within the Southwest Northwest or uh, elsewhere? So to start off that question, are those lines of questions, I should say, not just one, um, we're gonna talk a little bit about where they are distributed in the Southwest Northwest. And these gray areas you can see are, are areas in which scarlet macaws have been found uh, over this large region. And I wanna highlight first the Casas Grandes region in Northwestern Chihuahua, where we have the largest frequency of macaws, both scarlet military and uh, a large population of indeterminate macaws, as well as evidence of breeding. So things like macaw pens, where people were raising them, um, macaw eggshell, uh, a wide, grouping of, of age ranges for macaws and so on and so forth. Um, and these are all recovered in context dating from 1250 to 1450 CE. So you might be thinking that's a little late in the sequence if you're familiar with, with the Southwest Northwest um, regional time, temporal sequences. Um, so where, what was going on before then, right? Now the earliest large concentrations that we see prior to Pacine are seen in Membres, the, uh, the Membres region of Southwestern New Mexico, the Chaco region of Northwestern New Mexico and the Flagstaff area of North Central Arizona. Um, and they're highlighted here on the right side of the screen. And unlike Pacume, a very, very high percentage of parrots from these areas, as well as at later sites in the Mogollon Highlands are scarlet macaws. They're predominantly scarlet macaws in almost all of these contexts. So, um, and like I was saying before, right, some scholars have proposed that the Southwest Northwest peoples acquired macaws from West Mexico, um, but we have, have suggested and proposed that, that a route along the Rio Grande would have been a bit shorter and, and would have been a quicker way to get to that native um, endemic homeland of scarlet macaws where people could have procured them from, from the wild. Um, and indeed, we have early Spanish accounts that mention the breeding of, of guacamaya scarlet macaws at settlements between Tampico and Laredo um, and throughout this, this area. So to look back at the earliest occurrences in the Southwest Northwest, we see that, that it is actually uh, an instance of a military macaw. Uh, military macaws found it very, very early, early on in the sequence. Um, and this jives with what we're seeing in Mesoamerica actually, where we see military macaws at, um, at some of those really early sites in the, in the formative periods. Um, and this is found at Cueva de Avendanos, a rock shelter in Southern Chihuahua. A significant portion of the military macaw was recovered we have a calibrated radiocarbon date of 150 BCE to 20 CE. So much earlier than the macaws as we'll see in, in later slides that, that appear after that. Um, it likely at one point was a whole macaw, but the rock shelter had been disturbed. And so uh, all that we're left with is this fragment of the, the head of the macaw. And we also saw that there were human interments in the rock shelter, but no direct clear association with the macaw. And finally, the isotopes indicated, the stable carbon isotopes indicated a diet primarily of corn. So people would have been managing and holding on to this macaw for some time um, prior to its deposition. Now, moving into the Hocom region, uh, where we see the next earliest scarlet macaws, uh, and, and Christine Suter has, uh, has identified some of the macaws from Snake Town, where we see five single bones of scarlet macaws and thick-billed parrots. Um, single bones, right? So not the entire bird, but just a tiny little fragment of them. And these date between 600 and 800. Um, no clear associations with humans. They're found outside structures, sometimes in mounds. I mean, we have another, we have another handful of, of macaws that were found in pre-1150 CE um, com, uh, context. And those occur at El Macayo, just south of Tucson, where we have a macaw burial, a whole military macaw found in a human cemetery at Los Morteros near Tucson, uh, where, where we have uh, seven bones from two macaws found near a pit house floor at the Gatlin site in Gila Bend. Uh, where we see a whole scarlet macaw buried near a platform mound. And then again, at Pueblo Grande, where we have two partial birds. And so note that 
there's only two instances here where we have whole birds buried in a specific context. And in both of those instances, there's just one bird. So uh, again, highly fragmentary, um, not like we'll see in, in some later times. <clears throat> and after that, we have only nine or 10 known macaws in this area, even though it is close to West Mexico would have been a good, we know that it was a, a trading area and trading hub. So moving into Chaco and Mimbres, um, these two, uh, I should say regions, right, would be contemporaneous between around 900 and 1130 CE. Um, and some DNA work has been done here that indicates that all of these birds that were sampled uh, belong to the same rare haplogroup six. And this genetic homogeneity actually suggests that there likely was a breeding center north of their native distribution. Where specifically that is, we don't know at the moment. Uh, we'd love to know, but with more sampling uh, of ancient DNA, hopefully we can learn more about this. So getting into Chaco specifically, um, 37 of the 45 parrots from Chaco uh, were found in Pueblo Benito, and the majority of those were scarlet macaws. And uh, interestingly, the radiocarbon dates suggest that they were acquired between 950, around 950 and 1200 CE. And the, we know uh, from a previous study by Adam Watson and colleagues, right, that this was this predates a lot of those large construction sequences that we see uh, at scarlet uh, at, at Pueblo Benito. Um, and what we find in terms of their association with humans is that they were found in in room fill on the floors and subfloor pits. Uh, and almost all of the macaws were recovered uh, from the Northern and Eastern sections of the Pueblo, which we know are the uh, oldest and, and perhaps most important uh, segments of the Pueblo that would have perhaps had some restricted access, uh, maybe a little bit more private, maybe only certain people uh, could go in and, and visit. So the vast majority uh, are whole birds, which is really interesting to note um, as, we, as we continue talking about that pattern that died at approximately 11 to 13 months, right around the one year of age, we think. And the isotopes indicate a diet primarily of corn. Some of the limited radiogenic strontium isotope evidence actually indicates that they were raised uh, in the cat in the canyon itself, but with very little evidence of breeding, um, aside from a large room that many of these birds were kept in and, and ultimately found and deposited. So moving down into the Membrace region, we see most of these birds were found at eight or nine sites, um, but the vast majority of those birds were found at Galaz and Old Town, right? So just two of those sites. Uh, the radiocarbon dates are in the range of 895 to 1155, so not unlike the Pueblo Benito and Chaco Canyon birds. We see some associated with human burials. Uh, others are buried uh, by themselves or singly, and there's one uh, really interesting uh, military macaw that was deposited in, in perhaps a, a ceremonial room and, and um, covered with turquoise beads as well. But these contexts overall are very different from what we see at Chaco. Uh, we see some whole, but mostly uh, partial or single bones. Not a lot of birds buried or deposited whole. And we see diets of corn, right? So we know that these birds were also probably managed by humans and fed uh, corn, which humans were producing. So moving into the Flagstaff area, we see a really high frequency, the highest uh, of macaws and parrots, except for the Mogollon Highlands and Pakime, but only some that are whole or nearly whole. And I would say only few that are whole or nearly whole, really. The vast majority of these birds come from Wapaki Pueblo, uh, are dated to around 1025, 1275 CE. And we don't see them directly associated with people, um, but we find the macaws and humans um, and, and dogs as well, interestingly, um, kind of sharing these similar spaces in uh, above room uh, floors, contexts, or in the room fill. Some are buried with artifacts, treated like humans, actually wrapped in um, this rush matting that, that we know humans were also given the same kind of care. Um, and these contexts actually are quite a bit more similar to Chaco than what we're seeing in Membrace. And I like to say that they kind of echo uh, some of the bludger patterns that we're seeing in Chaco, which is not surprising because Wapaki itself has a lot of those different uh, architectural features and things like that, that that echo what we're seeing in Chaco. Um, and, and looking at that strontium evidence, we see that these birds are primarily raised locally, right? So people were caring for them um, right here in the, in the Flagstaff area. All right, so moving into the Mogollon Rim, um, we have primarily birds found at four large Pueblos. Those are at Turkey Creek, at Point of Pines, uh, as well as at Kanishpa and Grasshopper Pueblo. They date between 1240 and 1400 CE. <clears throat> and we find that the, the context in which they're found actually are really focused on ritual disposal. We see dedicatory offerings that are located below structure floors and in plazas. We off see offerings in termination rituals, um, in termination contexts that are generally in some communal ritual places. And we find at least 77 macaws and parrots from these four sites, right? So a big chunk of, of what we have in the Southwest Northwest are from this area. Um, and we see whole partial as well as just single bones. Um, were they managed by humans? That's something we're kind of actively waiting to hear the results of 
and we'll hopefully know more about that in, in the near future from a group who are working on this as we speak. All right, so turning to Pocky May, um, like I was saying before, this is one of the central hubs, an area that people really thought that, that macaws would have been transported into other parts of the Southwest. Uh, almost all of the birds in the Casas Grandes region around Pocky May come from Pocky May, except for one at a smaller site. They date between 1250 and 1450 CE. Uh, we see them buried, they're associated with people in some contexts. We also see them buried singly in paired sets of military and scarlet macaws or in large groups in plazas. Sometimes they're in multiple human interments as well with multiple birds. Sometimes they're in context just with birds. Sometimes they're buried in, in what seem to be circular arrangements where military macaws and scarlet macaws based on their color were oriented in very specific ways, right? So every kind of, of variation that you could see, we see at Pocky May. So very, very interesting cosmological um, practices being echoed there, we think. <clears throat> and although uh, Sean McCusick estimated that 503 macaws were found at Pocky May, uh, Mike Whalen has recently suggested in, in a book chapter, uh, one of the chapters from this book, that, that only 329 or so birds might have been uh, at the site. And so this is something that, that we're, again, super interested in learning more about and thinking a little bit more about. Uh, although most of these birds are scarlet macaws, there were far more military macaws at Pocky May than at any other site in the Southwest, Northwest, something like 80, 88, I think. Um, so lots of military macaws there, much more than elsewhere. And we know from the strontium, as well as from the uh, light-stable isotopes, that they were eating a diet primarily of corn. And interestingly, although Pocky May had the most macaws uh, of any of the sites that we're looking at, there was the most variation in where people were getting macaws. They were primarily locally raised, but we also see instances of macaws that were brought in um, both extra-regionally as well as within the Casas Grandes region, we think, um, that were brought into Pocky May. And, and we have some values, actually, that are so high, we think they may have come from northern parts of the southwest. Um, because the, the strontium values that they're, they're indicating don't, don't echo anything that we see throughout Mexico and into Central America. So, Okay, so in looking at this kind of regional overview, what have we learned uh, about macaws, right? Let's revisit some of those initial questions that we were talking about in the beginning, um, right? Macaws were not present in every place in time. Why is that? Well, when present in large numbers, we see really strong associations with aggregation into larger pueblos, as well as what we, what we call transformations in social landscapes. And I'll talk a little bit more about this in just a moment. Um, when we see macaws in small numbers, they're oftentimes uh, also at small sites, and they oftentimes have a large site with numerous macaws nearby, right? So they're oftentimes within a region, or perhaps they could have accessed macaws from a larger site that would have had better resources to, to perhaps either raise, uh, breed, or uh, go out and procure those macaws. <clears throat> we see no macaws north of Arizona and New Mexico. Even though Chaco great houses exist in southeastern Utah and southwestern Colorado, and even though we have feather bundles as well as apparel um, seen in southeastern Utah, which I think is really, really interesting and something uh, we're thinking about a little bit more. So we see also in the southwest that they're not necessarily tied to elites, but they certainly are in some places and times. And I want to highlight Pocky May, where we see um, macaws buried with humans, perhaps humans of status, and Chaco Canyon, where they're buried in very specific contexts and very restricted in private contexts. Uh, where, where perhaps not everyone would have been able to uh, been able to, to journey. We also see that the roles of macaws and parrots are not the same everywhere. We see really variable placement in sites. We don't see a lot of consistency in how they're placed and how they're deposited in different times and places. Uh, we see sometimes whole birds, we see sometimes partial birds, and we see sometimes single bones. And I want to recognize, um, especially at Wapaki, this could be in some cases because of uh, when they were excavated, right? I know at Wapaki, some of those excavations occurred in the 1930s and even sooner. Uh, and so uh, oftentimes the, the methods and techniques that people use perhaps could have contributed to these much more scattered distributions of single bones and, and things like that that we might not have been able to piece back together after, afterwards. So that's something that, that we definitely have, have been thinking about and considering in greater detail. So we see uh, that macaws ate primarily corn. Several carbon isotope studies support that macaws throughout the Southwest Northwest we're eating primarily corn and Pocky May as much as uh, we think most of their diet actually came from corn, right? So this was, uh, would have been a really important staple. People were certainly, certainly hand feeding these birds. Uh, and we also see that many were raised locally, right? The strontium isotopes at Chaco Canyon, at Wapaki, at Pocky May, and perhaps some other sites that we're looking into uh, will, will hopefully also show us that they were primarily raised locally. And interestingly, Pocky May is one of the sites that has kind of that more variable distribution, even though most of the birds there were, were raised locally. So, what can this, getting back to our discussion of Mesoamerica, what can this tell us about connectivity with Mesoamerica, right? This is one of the big reasons people have been interested in scarlet macaws, right? For their um, knowing that they would have had to be transported. And what we see really is that there's no clear complex, I would say, 
of cosmological or religious beliefs that were associated with macaws in the Southwest. And we certainly don't think that they were adopted from Mesoamerica in any kind of broad way. And I think this work is best demonstrated um, in comparison to the work that, that Petty Crown and, and Jeff, Jeffrey Hurst have done looking at cacao, looking at cylindrical vessels, looking at uh, instances of cacao at, at spe specifically Chaco Canyon, right? Where we see both the vessels, uh, perhaps the associations with, with elites who would have produced it, the uh, ways of manufacturing cacao and producing the chocolate beverage, all of these things, this whole complex was uh, adopted wholesale from perhaps the Maya region and, and West Mexico, where we know we have some evidence of that as well. Um, and so this is very different from what we see in relation to the macaws, right? Which certainly don't have that whole, we don't see the similarity of practices. We don't see a lot of consistency in practices. People seem to have been perhaps interpreting them in local ways and using them in local ways. And we also see, and just looking at some of those patterns, right? What is this broad scope of patterns? We see macaws primarily associated with directionality. Uh, we see them associated with processes of social aggregation and perhaps placemaking when large groups of people are coming together, as well as what we're, we're calling, for lack of a better word, I guess, transformations of social landscapes, right? Periods of time where we see migration, religious change, um, perhaps social aggregation, people aggregating and living in ways that they perhaps weren't living in before, movements from public or private to public um, rituals and, and things like that, more communal forms of society and thinking about the world. Um, and this is where we see macaws kind of start to par pop up, especially in, in, in thinking about Pueblo Benito, right? And, and macaws uh, appearing there right before the rise of, of that large site. Now looking uh, back again at the patterns of Mesoamerica, right? We see asynchronous adoptions and uses of scarlet macaws in the Southwest and Northwest when compared to Mesoamerica. The timing of some of the archeological uh, instances of scarlet macaws in Mesoamerica really don't match up with the timing uh, of the appearance of scarlet macaws in the Southwest Northwest. And this is something that we do see with like copper um, in Michoacan, we see copper kind of popping up at right around the same time as we see it in the Southwest Northwest. And, um, but it's not something we see with the scarlet macaws. So it doesn't seem to be those larger regional patterns that might be influencing this, these larger synchronicities. Uh, we see overall that scarlet macaws are much more numerous in the Southwest Northwest, despite the great distance from their endemic habitat. Uh, and this is also true, I think, of their cosmological presence. We see them depicted in ceramics, murals, and stone far more than we see them in Mesoamerica, even though Mesoamerican sites are quite larger um, and, and quite more numerous than, than a lot of what we've recorded in the Southwest Northwest. And I wanna highlight for a second that these traditions of incorporating scarlet macaws were very long lasting, uh, many of which continue today uh, in descendant communities. And from an outside perspective, it may seem strange that these non-local scarlet macaws are found in the arid Southwest and Northwest, really far from their endemic habitat. But if you look at this kind of from an archeological and from indigenous perspectives, these long distance patterns of long distance exchange of macaw keeping and perhaps even macaw breeding over hundreds and, and thousands of years have really interwoven macaws into the origin stories and traditional histories continue to be passed down today. Um, and I'm, I draw on a quote here from Octavia Seotua um, from, from the chapter in this, in this book, who says, when a ceremonial bird like a macaw dies at Zuni, it is treated like a member of the family with food offerings and prayer meal placed with it for its use in the afterlife. And I quote Octavius here to highlight that we're learning more and more about the significance of macaws every day and that the voices um, in, in, of traditional knowledge keepers, indigenous archaeologists and indigenous people generally um, and how they articulate with the uh, archaeological record should really be at the forefront um, in our consideration of these discussions because they're, they're, they can be really impactful and are really important. So if you're interested in this topic, um, I highly, highly recommend, I'm not above a shameless self-promotion here, I highly, highly recommend that you check out uh, our, our volume, Birds of the Sun, which was released in March uh, of this year. Uh, all of this and more, there are so many great chapters actually that we didn't even get to talk about in here. All of this and more can be found within this volume. It's at the University of Arizona Press um, and check it out. And this I'm excited to reveal is the cover image of the Archaeology Southwest magazine issue that will be coming out in the next month. Um, it was kind of a, a monumental task. There, there's a lot, a lot of uh, contributions to this. It's a very long issue. Um, and I hope that everyone will love it as much as I'm loving reading through the contributions. It's gonna be really, really incredible. So. Um, with that, I want to acknowledge um, all of these different people and groups of people, right? Um, the Ameren Foundation for its role in making this book a reality, um, Allison Carter and the team at the University of Arizona Press, all of the authors uh, that we listed here in, as well as those that, that we didn't get a chance to talk about, uh, as well as Kate Sarther, Bill Dolly, Sarah Anderson, the entire team at Archaeology Southwest and Archaeology Southwest Magazine. Definitely check out the book. 
um, the fantastic cover image from Benjamin Hargio Jr., who that I want to highlight here. Um, and with that, I will end this share screen and hopefully be available to take questions from everyone. I really look forward to it. Thank you, Chris. That was really wonderful. Um, Pat and Steve, are you guys going to come back for the question period or? Yeah. Pat threatened to leave her um, her mic muted, but I can unmute her. So <laughs> thank you. So yeah, for everybody who's out there, the 300 people who have been joined us, um, you probably know, um, put your questions in the Q&A and I will try to throw some of these out and we'll start having a little bit of a discussion. Um, so um, we'll start out with just a couple simple, maybe a couple, well, anyway, we'll just get started. <laughs> so we had a question about um, the whole body macaw burials. Um, um, I don't know that you can really know, but we were wondering um, were, if they're, do you think they were then buried with their feathers, with the ceremonial feathers, or would those, is there any way that you would know that kind of thing? Yeah, I can take this one. Uh, there have been a lot of instances where, and, and I know Lyndon Hargrave in his Mexican macaws volume talked a lot about the size of the burial pits in which the macaws were found and stated that they were so small that like that these long tail feathers, right, which are super, I uh, got one right here, I'm not prepared at all. These long tail feathers, right, they almost cover the entirety of the screen, you know, my, an entire arm. Um, would not have fit in those burial pits sitting at the very end of, of the macaw. And so the idea is that they were probably plucked prior to them being deposited in, in a lot of those pits. And he kept a very good inventory of which ones had you know, evidence of that and which ones didn't have evidence of that. But of course, the contexts are different throughout the Southwest, uh, Northwest. So, and, and, and Pat and Steve, happily, please jump in if you want to add to that at all. Uh, <clears throat> there's ev evidence from the bones also that show that they were plucked. Mm, so, okay. you know, um, that's another key, key aspect of it. And, and plucked repeatedly. Um, the bones have pits in them and those pits kind of get infected and, um, and it shows up on the bones. And actually, this is one of the chapters I didn't, we didn't get to highlight in, the, um, in this volume is the work by Kelly Taylor and Randy Flatabo. Uh, who who did a really detailed look at, at this exact thing and, and found that a lot of the pathologies that we see, such as feather plucking, such as poor conditions, might actually have contributed to those macaws dying at around one year of age and, and not necessarily this, this um, the widespread ritual deposition of these macaws or sacrifice to these macaws at a certain time of year. That, I mean, that's true. that speaks directly, I think, to a question I have which um, an attendee was asking about, would they have had those long feathers at the young age that they were found? But yeah, it sounds like they would have. And yeah, yeah. interesting, actually. Yeah. Um, so um, are scarlet macaws more durable <laughs> compared to other macaw species, if you get what we mean? I think, it might that be why they're more popular? Or are they maybe... Harder to kill <laughs> accidentally. <laughs> They're all mean. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I I wouldn't think so. I no. mean, they vary well, they vary in size somewhat, but um, you know, the bones are just as durable. Um, there's nothing about the skeletal evidence that would make you think that um a scarlet macaw would preserve better than a military macaw. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't think it's an issue of preservation at all. Yeah, and I think if Kelly Taylor were here, she would say that macaws are perhaps, <coughs> scarlet macaws are perhaps less durable than, than other macaws and, and more finicky about the conditions in which they need to be kept and, and, and so on. And, and because they're a tropical bird as opposed to military macaws and thick billed parrots, for example, um, they might have, a, it might be harder to keep them alive here in the Southwest Northwest. But they do have those gorgeous red feathers. So they do. Yeah, yeah. You, you know, you mentioned Kelly um, Taylor, Chris. Did any of you guys um, see her at the Pecos conference last year when she brought one of her birds? 
Can any yeah. of you speak about that visit or the impression that gave you? Yeah, it was it was really fun. She actually had it on a leash. And explain, um, and I think maybe was, explain for people who don't know who Kelly is or why. Sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Kelly, Kelly Taylor is the is the founder of, of Sacred Scarlet's uh, preservation organization looking at scarlet macaws in the Southwest, past, present, and future. Um, and she has two macaws at home and has is a longtime macaw, um, not not breeder raiser, um, someone who's adopted many macaws through the years and, and just knows a profound amount um, about those birds and she brought a six week old Scarlet Macaw to the Pecos conference this year and had it on a leash, you know, like a, like a dog. <laughs> um, and it was kind of just jumping around, investigating people's purses and, and belongings and stuff like that, sitting on laps, um, you know, interested in people, disinterested in people, picking at stuff and walking around. And, and it was a really, really fun and, and interesting opportunity. And, and Kelly was part of our um, Ameren symposium that we mm -hmm. had. And she brought her two adult macaws with her. And one noontime, um, she, we all went outside and she flew them. They flew free yeah. outside. And it was an amazing thing to see. Wow. Um, wow. They're big birds. And, yeah. and, and they came back to her, which speaks to the human management of macaws mm -hmm. um, yeah. under some circumstances. That's amazing. That's amazing. I was at Pegas. I remember just seeing just it was just wonderful to see that little little one to see a big one. Well, yeah. um, there's been a lot of questions um, about corn as a diet. Um, people are mm -hmm. like, you know, I raise parrots and if I just fed them corn, that's not very healthy. And um, so can you speak about the concept of like, I mean, could, could the corn have actually been contributing to the fact that they died young and doesn't sound like people think a full corn diet is a very good idea for a parrot or a macaw. Yeah, it would have been terrible. It would not have been good <laughs> at all. Um, macaws eat a, a diet that's rich in fruits and seeds um, and, and all kinds of different things. And interestingly, you could find things that macaws could eat uh, locally here in the South, almost throughout the Southwest Northwest. Um, you could find different fruits and seeds and nuts and things like that that you could have fed the macaws regularly. And Maize and corn is not bad for macaws. In fact, a lot of people who um, have macaws today will feed limited amounts of corn to the macaws um, along with fruits and nuts and seeds and things like that. Um, but yeah, it would have been really, really tough on them dietarily. Um, it could have caused uh, various different kinds of problems for the macaws um, in, in term, it could have caused organs to shut down, right? And different things like that. It would have been um, certainly not an optimal situation. It would have, could, could have caused feather loss, it could have caused um, the macaws to pluck at their feathers and, and do other kinds of things that they do when they're distressed. And it could have caused illness, um, psittacosis, parrot-borne illnesses that they could have transferred uh, amongst both macaws and people. So. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, I mean, another factor affecting, I think, their mortality was where they were kept. I mean, we have Pueblo Benito, for example, there's a room that would have been a very dark room on, a fir on the first floor. Mm -hmm. It had 14 scarlet macaws in it. So, you know, 14 scarlet macaws with little sunlight. I mean, I'm sure they were brought, brought out from time to time, uh, especially during, during rituals. But nevertheless, they probably spent most of their time in these dark spaces. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, let's see. I've got all sorts of questions, so I'm trying to get my way through it. Here's a good one. Dr. Schwartz, when compiling this presentation, what piece of data or information surprised you the most and why? Does that sound like a kind of question you'd ask your students? <laughs> yeah, yes, it does. It's one I have asked my students. It's a good question. Um, yeah, no, definitely a good question. I think the thing that, that caught me most, but like, oh, duh, that's amazing, is the fact that you know, you have this population of um, 500 macaws at Pakime. You have a population of 400 and 500 turkeys at Pakime that were found there. Um, and this idea that, that Kelly Taylor kind of planted in my mind that, that both macaws and, and turkeys are carriers of psittacosis, which is a chlamydial infection um, that is also transferred amongst humans. It's uh, associated with pigeons nowadays. It's transferred amongst pigeons as well. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea that people almost certainly suffered from psittacosis at Pakime, right? They would have had to, these macaws were kept in, in probably not great conditions. They weren't being fed a diet that, that is good for them. Um, when macaws are kept in captivity today, 
they instances of, of psittacosis can can hit them really, really quickly and affect like 90% of the populations. Um, and especially when they're being transported, that's something that, that people are always looking out for because they're, they're particularly susceptible to it. Um, and so that for me was like, oh my gosh, people uh, almost certainly, right, would have, would have suffered from that um, at this time. So hmm. it's something you wouldn't, wouldn't think about otherwise. Hmm. I don't, what do you two think, Steve and Pat, about, about uh, surprising things, not necessarily yeah. just the psittacosis? To me, the most surprising thing was how different the macaws are used across the Southwest. Coming into it, I knew they were used differently between Mimbris and Chaco, but as the case studies kept coming in, every case study uh, was different. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that was pretty surprising to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I would say the, the lack of scarlet macaws or military macaws in not total lack, but you know, extremely low frequencies at sites in Mesoamerica. I mean, it's, yeah. perhaps it's because they have easy access to the feathers, um, but I would have thought there would have been many more sites uh, where you have, would have had macaw, scarlet macaw burials, yeah. um, especially at the Maya, Maya region where they were so important. Yeah. That that surprised me when you this evening. I was surprised by that. Yeah. Um, specific question. Um, I think they mean Casas Grandes. Is there a date for the bird found at? Oh yes, it is Casas Grandes. Is it says Casas Grande? Was I'm not Casa Grande or yeah? Is there a date for the bird found at Casas Grandes that appears? from the strontium evidence to be from the north? And does that date correspond to anything known to be going on in, Ch in Chaco? Unfortunately, not yet, there is not. Well, then yeah. we don't know. <laughs> we don't know yet, yeah, that's, yes. that, no, you are. Yeah. Okay. I, I, it's unlikely that it would date to Chaco times just because that's that's quite a bit earlier than Pakimei. Mm -hmm. um, not quite a bit, but about a thousand years earlier than, than Pakimei, but perhaps, um, but that, that it could relate to Wapatki, it could relate to the Holocom region, it could relate to some of these other areas. Um, so. Yeah, more mm -hmm. like a, a hundred years difference, not- Oh, sorry, not a thousand. <laughs> not a thousand, yeah. And we do find some of the macaws in Chaco may have dated as late as 1200. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Pakume gets, gets going at 1250. And there, you know, there could have been earlier uh, occupations before that, but that's one of the reasons why we'd very much like to date some of the macaws from Pakume. Yeah, yeah. Um, a friend up at Himalabis asks, have you spoken with Chuck Adams or Rich Lang about the macaw skeletal remains of Himalabi? She says also that she was told years ago that the Verde Valley was at the northern edge of the Parrot's natural range, is, is that correct? Also, uh, just to comment that her Hopi um, Supai neighbor came over a few minutes ago and was enjoying your presentation. <laughs> so. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's wonderful um, yeah. to know. Uh, do you, I, I have not spoke, spoken with Chuck Adams, unfortunately. Not yet, unfortunately, mm -hmm. about that. I don't know if either of you have. I mean, I asked someone, not them, who worked there. Um, and it's best, if from what they said, there were only two scarlet macaws at, at the Himalavi site. So they're not for large pueblos where, where they seem to be most common in the Southwest. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not frequent there at all. So it, it's surprising because by that time they started to show up on pottery um, and rock art, you know, certainly in Kivas in the Hopi area. Um, so yeah, why you're not actually getting the birds themselves um, is kind of surprising. Yeah, yeah. And in terms of the distribution uh, of macaws or, or parrots into the Verde Valley, there's an historic um, piece that says that there were thick-billed parrots, as I remember it, in the Verde Valley, but that's never been substantiated. Yeah. And I don't, I think none of us knows what to make of that. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Yeah. I, I think the idea is that they'd come up the Sierra Madre Accidental Mountains and then hit, you could follow mountain ranges and yeah. sort of high elevations up um, 
you know, past Tucson up into the Mogollon Highlands and, and perhaps into the Verde Valley area. Um, but, but yeah, again, I, I have not seen them myself. Um, so, but I, maybe it wouldn't be crazy for one or two to get to, to end up out there. Yeah. Yeah. So where, where single bones are getting, are being found, being identified, um, is there any patterning in the, what that bone is, or is it varied again? It, we're not seeing like they're using legs or wings or something. No. <laughs> So what do you think that? <clears throat> I don't think so. I don't think so. I'd have to look at that. We'd have to look at that. Um, the, interesting, the interesting question to me about the single bones is did they come from another bird someplace else? And would we ever be able to match up those single bones with the birds they came from? Um, that would be pretty cool. Hmm. Yeah, in the Flagstaff area, we um, long long bones are oftentimes the, what were preserved, but that's just because they're the largest. Um, we would expect that um, taphonomically that that long bones are are what are going to preserve. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, so, a couple simple questions, hopefully for you all. Do you know have they have we found the cause elsewhere in the United States, like California, California? or in Baja, which is not the United States, I understand, I realize, uh, or even over in Cahokia. I mean, what do we know about macaws beyond the Southwest Northwest? Any ideas? No. Certainly not at Cahokia. No? Okay. Um, I think <clears throat> Baja and California, I think none of the three of us know anything about, so. Yeah. Um, I I don't know if any macaw remains from the eastern U.S. Yeah. Um, it's possible that some of them may appear in imagery, but um, eagles are much are really seem to be the by far the most common bird that appears, um, you know, carved shell, mm -hmm. that type of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and and bird who else it. <clears throat> we'll say bones don't generally preserve well in a lot of the eastern U.S. because of the acidic soils. So, you know, if you were, if you had a macaw in Virginia, um, the red Virginia clay, uh, they would not last probably more than 100 to 150 years. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I just had a comment from someone just FYI about thick billed parrots that there had there was an effort in recent times to reintroduce them into the Chiricahuas here in southeast Arizona. It was not successful. As yes. put it. The, the hawks loved them. <laughs> yeah. but, but historically, there have been things called eruptions, IRR eruption, um, which is describes birds coming into an area that they aren't normally in, but that there's some food source there. Um, and it would have been probably pinon nuts for thick-billed parrots in the Chiricahuas. And there is historical evidence of them having erupted into the Chiricahuas. Mm -hmm. um, but apparently the ones that they reintroduced um, weren't accustomed to hawks or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice. We have a comment from uh, John Pohl. Um, mm -hmm. He says that um, we don't find many um, Quetzal remains in Mesoamerica either. Macaws tend to be drawn to fruit tree and cacao plantations in Mesoamerica and are widely accessible, therefore, in the habitational environments. I think the real issue is that archaeologists, for the most part, haven't collected a lot of faunal remains in their excavations, especially of elite built environments. So. Mm -hmm. suggestion I think from perhaps a Mesoamerican archaeologist that yes there be some collection issues there yeah no I, I know the name for sure that's um <laughs> yeah that's really interesting that's really an interesting and important thing to think about I think because Quetzals are the other thing where you would think that they would appear uh, given how important they are how often they appear in Mesoamerican especially Mayan art um in, in in all kinds of things you would think that they would appear in cosmologically and, and everything and i see that he, he also left a comment here are you aware of the profound cults of Xochipilli as a patron and god of the nawa and and i am um but i was not i don't think i was familiar that he addresses as a scarlet macaw um and um we're looking into that a little bit more certainly especially in, in mesoamerican cosmology that's not 
because there is a chapter published does not mean that that is a, a discussion that's over. Um, and I've talked to Michael Mathiewicz about this a, a bunch um, and we'll continue hopefully to do so. <clears throat> well, and just FYI, we'll we'll send you you speakers all all of these comments and stuff. And if there are Great. people you want to follow up with or connect with um, specifically, because there's been some comments and suggestions and things, so you may you might find some of that interesting. So definitely, um, we had a question about um, could you speak about where is um, where's my question? How did they put this? <clears throat> um, was this project based on data from digital archives and databases? So. Well, we can turn to our resident expert, yeah, Steve. Yeah. <laughs> I think, <clears throat> I think, <I'll, clears throat> excuse me, I think only in the case of Chaco, um, but that just served as a kind of a baseline for Kate Bishop's dissertation. Um, if Kate had not gone in and done the detailed analysis um, of the scarlet macaws from Benito, we wouldn't have nearly the information. So. Um, the presence of them is certainly known from the digital archive uh, mm -hmm. in Chaco, but I don't think from any other area. Hmm. Yeah, a lot of this work was done, um, at least the work looking at the contextual, um, or I guess just the macaws, right? Looking at the macaws themselves was done by Lyndon Hargrave, who compiled, you know, over 100 um, hundreds of scarlet macaws from throughout the Southwest Northwest did measurements on all of them determined morphologically from bone characteristics, whether they were scarlets or militaries. Um, <clears throat> and we've drawn a ton on the work that he's done. Um, and I think everyone in every region that we've worked with has drawn a ton on this. We have done some destructive analysis on, on macaw remains, but almost this entire project has really been oriented on just reconstructing some of those contexts that we don't know about. I know that was my mission uh, at Wapatki, was looking through, pouring over old records, using legacy information and things like that to, to look at what is the con what are the contexts and cause were found in. I know Kate Bishop did a ton of that at Chaco Canyon too, trying to understand um, what's going on. And I think, I think the, all of us did uh, probably a lot of that and looking at the re records and reports. I think even, um, you know, only a handful of us have really even handled a ton of macabre remains uh, for this component, right? For putting a, together these, Kind of summary chapters and we really used a lot of the data that's out there um, except for when we needed to go and revisit some of these things does that i hope that answers the question pat what do you think and and what we're hoping is that the book will provide the baseline for a whole lot of future research um, on macaws uh, yeah. so the data are in the book probably more than most people would want <laughs> although there's some pretty interesting stuff in the book too mm -hmm. <laughs> But there's a lot more to know. I mean, as yeah. you said, I, I hope there'll be many more studies in the future that will build off the work we did. Mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent. Yeah. Um, did, do you think that, was there anything that is coming out of um, the studies that you know, you, you've done or the things that you've learned that, that might have an import for you know, conservation and the cause today might have any kind of impact on What's going on today? Yeah, so um, Randy Flatbo and Kelly Taylor put together an incredible chapter in the book that actually reevaluates the age characteristics, the age characteristics and the age categories for scarlet macaws. Um, and this draws on and I think produced a more compelling <laughs> version of how we should age these birds um, and looking at morphological characteristics on the bone and looking at how we designate these um, designate the birds more generally. Mm -hmm. um, so some of that work as well as looking at pathologies. I know Randy is doing CT scans of macaw bone and looking to see if she can find medullary bone and looking to see if she can find evidence of feather plucking and other kinds of morphological characteristics um, from treatment of macaws that might turn up on bone. And I think this would be really important for understanding, you know, how macaws are treated generally, um, right, in, in these larger networks of, of people taking macaws and trying to transport them illegally and finding out what's going on with that. Mm -hmm. So I think there's some kind of cool implications there. Oh. Um, I'm trying to think of, of what, I mean, aside from the obvious importance of, of um, macaws to indigenous communities here in the Southwest, Northwest, um, and, and the contribution of Octavius and Peter Whiteley and, and other folks that have, have contributed to the, some of those ongoing discussions. But is there, is there any other chapter I left out? Maybe there's another one where, where that kind of thing was discussed. I don't know. I don't think so. And, you know, I mean, in, in terms of the 
the work that's being done in in uh, southern Mexico and Central America to try and reestablish and build up the native populations. Um, like Chris said, you know, these our research has some indirect implications, but you know, it's far more compl complex than mm -hmm. anything that we touch on. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. Thank you. No, that's great. Uh, we could uh, keep going forever and ever, but um, we have been at this an hour now, so I think we might need to wrap it up, but um, it sounds very much like we all need to read the book. Um, <laughs> I think it's in our library. I need to go check and make sure and then you look at it now. Uh, but thank you all very much. And we will send you the, all of the questions and answers in case there's anything else in there that you feel like you might want to um, follow up on. But, Wonderful. Yeah, thank you so much. And I'm going to ask Dr. Dolly to come back, if you will, because he gets to wrap us up again for the season. No, happy to come back after such an incredible presentation tonight. What, what an um, appropriate way to end the, the season here with the preview of a book that you can uh, actually buy today and another magazine coming soon that you will be able to put it have in your hands uh, in less than 30 days, hopefully. So this avian archaeology series has been by far the most successful um, you know, series of presentations that we've put on. Uh, and I continue to see the way in which the topic of birds, you know, brings researchers together with interesting new perspectives across areas um, and the ways in which, you know, there's connections to our, um, you know, our current native communities uh, across the Southwest, Northwest, and the way it reaches out to a broad general public. So this has been, uh, if people have a comparable subject <laughs> that we could implement next year, please <laughs> suggest, because um, this has just been wonderful. Um, so just for the other authors who, um, again, Chris, uh, you and Caitlin Bishop putting this you know, magazine together and the three of you putting the, the book project together, uh, this is just a, a massive thanks to all of you, and we look forward to, we will be having a new series next year, or next fall, but uh, boy, <laughs> we haven't settled on, uh, because this was such a special um, you know, set of talk speakers and, and uh, successful presentations, we haven't settled on what that will be, so it's open for, for ideas. So we look forward to um, seeing you next fall, uh, all of you out there across the land. And uh, again, just thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all. Have a good summer. Take care. All.